decided there was indeed something extraordinary about him, even something frightening. His face was as black and still as an African mask, revealing nothing of what he was thinking, but his eyes seemed to stare right into one's soul and know what was hidden there. Toussaint had trained another man named Jean-Jacques Dessalines to be one of his most powerful generals. Although he couldn't read or write, Dessalines devised very smart battle plans. He was a brave and brilliant soldier, but he was filled with hate. People called him the Tiger, not just because of his fierceness in battle, but because his body was as ringed with stripes as a tiger's. Those ray stripes were scars from the many weapons he did. he had when he was a slave. After a victory, Toussaint always gave the order, no reprisals, no reprisals. He hated any more killing than was necessary in battle, especially the killing of women and children, black, white, or brown. Whenever Dessalines heard the order, he fidgeted in angry frustration with his proudest possession, an elegant French gold enameled snuff box. He wanted to avenge himself on all whites and lots remaining on Saint-Domingue, but his wife agreed with Toussaint and Dessalines adored her. Between the two of them, he obeyed. Picture here is of Dessalines, about to stab a white man, this wife holding his body. And Toussaint is holding back his bayonet, yelling at him to stop. Years of revolution and war had impoverished the nation. 
Napoleon wanted the greater profits of slave-grown sugar and secretly planned to restore slavery in all French West Indian islands, including Saint-Domingue. Then he intended to launch a conquest of the land France claimed on the North American continent. No one knew of this except General Charles-Victor Emmanuel Leclerc. The brave and handsome husband of Napoleon's favorite sister, Pauline, was given the job of carrying out the first stage of the plan. In a long, secret document to Leclerc, Napoleon gave orders that Toussaint was to be gotten rid of. That he wrote instructions as to how it should be done. Leclerc should flatter him at first. As soon as he had Toussaint's trust, he was to take him prisoner and ship him to France. Perhaps Napoleon, with his huge ego, overestimated Toussaint's own influence, not acknowledging how much the black people of Saint-Domingue would do for liberty, with or without their leader. Napoleon was confident that after Toussaint was gone, slavery would be easily restored by force. Leclerc and his troops, including those black soldiers and officers trained by Toussaint, would then sail for New Orleans to occupy the great unmapped land west of the Mississippi River, the land called the Louisiana Territory, which France claimed. When Leclerc sailed from France, more than 20,000 soldiers followed in many ships. It was a huge military undertaking. Napoleon's army was the bravest and best trained in Europe. Some weren't French, but freelance mercenary soldiers from various nations who made their living going to war for whatever country paid them. A few of these mercenaries were American. At the beginning of 1801, Toussaint stood at the crest of a hill near Le Cap overlooking the sea. It was a place where he liked to go to think. When he saw the huge fleet sailing toward the island, he guessed immediately why they had come. He was horrified that the first consul, whom he had up to that moment admired and trusted, was set out to destroy the very liberty he claimed to believe in. But Toussaint could see no other reason that Napoleon had sent such a large fleet. Thomas Jefferson also learned of the massive fleet sailing to Saint-Domingue. Why had Napoleon sent so many soldiers? Saint-Domingue was at peace. Jefferson rightly suspected that the troops planned to continue to the United States, which wouldn't stand a chance against this invasion. It had an army fewer than 1,000 men. The pictures of um, Capucian burning. We'll find out why soon. In those days, conquering armies lived by occupying the homes and eating the food of the conquered. Toussaint knew his people could survive off the land better than Europeans could, for it was their home. The French soldiers would have a difficult time managing without cities and towns and farms to feed and house them. So Toussaint, Dessaline, and Christophe made plans for the island's defense. They would each be in charge of one third of the island, and they would burn everything the French could eat or sleep in as the army advanced. Henri Christophe had the job of defending the camp. Shortly before the first French troops came ashore, Christophe gave his orders. He began by putting a torch to the curtains of his own elegant home. Citizens ran screaming through the streets toward the mountain as the fire spread and an ammunition warehouse exploded. General Leclerc and his soldiers came ashore to nothing but ashes. The war that Napoleon had assured Leclerc would take only a month had begun. Leclerc saw immediately that Napoleon had been overly optimistic. The first consul didn't know what expert fighters these soldiers and officers Toussaint Louverture were trained were. They were also well equipped with American-made cannons, uniforms, and guns. Hidden in the mountain forest, Toussaint's soldiers attacked without warning. More and more of Leclerc's army fell. He wrote Napoleon, begging him to come and see for himself how courageous and undefeatable these black soldiers were. He told the first consul how well disciplined the former slaves were, and most important, how willing they were to die for victory, for liberty, having tasted its sweetness. Toussaint also wrote Napoleon, which you can see in the picture here, dictating a letter. He begged him to come and see the beautiful island he had governed so well for France, assuring him that they could work together for the same great cause, liberty and peace for all. But Napoleon didn't answer Toussaint's letters, so Toussaint sent messages to his general saying, Wait until the rains come. Big ol' picture, big ol' mosquito. Mackendall's return. Question mark. In the tropics, there are two seasons, wet and dry. Starting in March, rain comes down hard every day, as it always does in season year after year. It leaves puddles where dormant mosquito eggs hatch. In Toussaint's time, no one knew that a certain mosquito sting caused one of the most dangerous diseases in the tropics. But he and many others have noticed that black people didn't catch it as readily or as severely as the whites. Yellow fever may have come from Africa and stacking in pools of water from the slave ships. 
people from Africa had generations of exposure to the virus that causes yellow fever. Immunity, Europeans lacked. The disease attacks the liver and causes the skin and whites of the eyes to turn yellow with jaundice before the victim dies. The slaves who prophesied that the spirit of Mackintosh lived on in the form of a mosquito were close to the truth. With the rains, yellow fever began attacking the French troops. The troops, some French troops marching in the rain. One of the mercenary soldiers serving under Leclerc was from Kentucky. He struck up a conversation with an American businessman he met in Le Cap, telling him he'd be glad to get home. It wouldn't be long, he confided. Leclerc would be continuing on to New Orleans soon, as soon as they were finished on Santo Domingue. Spies brought this news to Jefferson. More than 20,000 soldiers had come to a strange land to fight under General Leclerc. Many of these young Europeans believed that it was a far better fate to be conquered by Napoleon to serve in his army than to be ruled and kept subservient by their nobility. England was the strongest enemy Napoleon had. The party line of Napoleon's followers was just that just as the American colonists had fought to rid themselves of British rule, so must all Caribbean islands defend themselves against Britain. Soldiers fighting under Leclerc and saint domingue believed what they were told. That Toussaint was an enemy of France, who was planning to bargain away the riches of that island to British colonial forces in nearby Jamaica. It didn't matter whether these European soldiers were French or not. After all, their hero wasn't French by birth. The truth was the opposite of what they thought. Indeed, Britain was a threat. That nation had tried to take advantage of France after the successful slave rebellion led by Toussaint Louverture. But European soldiers in Napoleon's great army Many of him spoke neither English nor French, had no way of knowing that Toussaint had been a hero for France when he drove English and Spanish would-be conquerors out of Saint-Domingue and saved the island for France. They believed they were fighting against English tyranny that would destroy liberty wherever it found it. Hadn't France come to the aid of the American colonists in the War of Independence, their war for their liberty against the King of England? Soldiers were willing to die for the great cause of liberty, for it was their cause too. But things happened to make them question the war's purpose. One night, 10,000, oh sorry, 12,000 of the clerk's soldiers pitched their tents outside the walls of a fort where Dessalines had stationed 1,200 soldiers. Suddenly they heard singing from behind the walls. They recognized the words and music immediately. Come, children of the homeland, our day of glory has arrived. Let us fight against all tyranny that flies its bloody flag. It's a picture of the soldiers listening to the how could this be? The black soldiers inside the fort were singing the very song that the poor of Paris had sung years earlier as they marched through the streets. They knew it well, for the stirring Marseillaise had become the national anthem of the French Republic. Was it possible that the first consul had deceived them? Was it possible that they had been sent to Santo Domingue not to preserve liberty, but to destroy it? One entire regiment, which happened to be made up of Polish soldiers, <laughs> it's hard to say, Polish soldiers, decided that this was indeed the case. That night they surrendered. In the morning came the regiment fought with, not against, Dessalines and his soldiers. In spite of this event, Dessalines was still convinced that there could be no peace between black and white people, that saint domingue must win independence from France, kill all the whites on the island and go its own way. But Toussaint did not agree. Picture of Toussaint with, um, I believe the cleric, and a very astute-looking French soldier. Surprise and betrayal. Yellow fever was spreading fast among the French troops. Napoleon ordered reinforcements to saint -Domingue. Another 30,000 troups under the command of General Donatien marie joseph de Vimeur, Vicomte de Rochambeau. To everyone's surprise, Christophe suddenly surrendered to the French. Leclerc tried to bribe him to turn Toussaint over, knowing that Christophe liked to live extravagantly. To his credit, Christophe refused. If Toussaint, who left a record of who he was in the many eloquent letters he wrote to various members of the government in Paris, is an enigma, Christophe is more of one. Some historians believe he was severely mentally ill, with violent mood swings that went from full of grandiose ideas to deep despair. He seems to have been a man of charm and charisma whom Toussaint found useful. Was it a plot of his that Christophe should surrender when he did? And if so, why? Historians don't understand why Christophe surrendered or what happened next. French soldiers were dying in great numbers each day, and Leclerc himself was sick with yellow fever. Toussaint had the advantage. But since he never shared his thoughts with others, no one knows to this day why Toussaint did what he did. 
he sent word that he wanted to meet with the cleric and work out terms for his surrender. It's possible that Tucson, a wily politician who understood human nature, wanted to let the cleric and through him the first consul save face. If Napoleon and the French people believed that they had been victorious in spite of their terrible losses, Napoleon would retain power. Toussaint may have been gambling that it was better to deal with the enemy he knew than the unknown. Or he may have simply believed that there had been too much fighting and dying, too much destruction of the beautiful forests and farms and the land he was so proud of. It was time for peace, time to rebuild. Because he had the advantage with his great self-confidence, Toussaint may have been sure he could control peace from behind the scenes. In peace and seemingly without power, he would work with Napoleon for the good of France and saint and for liberty everywhere. But he didn't understand how much Napoleon hated him, although the two men had never met. General Toussaint Louverture rode to town wearing his full dress uniform with golden epaulets, shining boots, three cornered hat, and gleaming sword. For he knew this was a solemn moment for him and his country. The road was lined for miles with people tossing flowers in his path, calling out, Papa Toussaint, never leave us. Toussaint promised he wouldn't. So we see in the picture, riding on his horse, the flowers being thrown, the horse's hooves, people calling out to him. He offered to retire from active duty and attend his farm. In return for this offer of peace, he wanted assurance that slavery would never be restored to some domain. That all soldiers and officers in his army could stay armed, even though he himself would not be. The cleric agreed to the terms, and Toussaint returned home. Then Dessalines surrendered. He was shrewd. Dessalines knew that most of the French soldiers were dead or dying. The cleric would join them, he was sure, but as long as Napoleon's brother-in-law was around and in power, Dessalines would play the white man's game. <laughs> he swore allegiance to the cleric and told him he could always trust and rely on him. As he did, Dessalines warned the cleric that although he himself could be trusted, the cleric must never trust Toussaint. It wasn't true, but Dessalines knew he would soon rule, and rule according to his own bitter and brutal convictions, not Toussaint's far more humane version. Even though Dessalines betrayed Toussaint, he was not the cause of what happened next. Napoleon had already decided Toussaint's fate. One of the clerk's officers invited Toussaint to dinner to discuss further details of the peace treaty. When Toussaint entered the dining room, French soldiers jumped up and tied him up. They took him to a ship sailing that night for France. His last words as he boarded it were, You have cut down the trunk of the Tree of Liberty, but the roots will push on, for they are many and deep. The pictures. Toussaint in handcuffs being led by French soldiers. French soldiers. Thirty thousand French troops reached Saint-Domingue under the command of General de Rochambeau. The 
the cleric died of yellow fever and Rochambeau began a massacre of black civilians that was far more brutal than anything the cleric had ordered. These atrocities, the murders of women and children and old people, proved to Dessaline that he had, what he had always believed, that whites could never be trusted. His surrender and pledge of loyalty had, after all, been to Leclerc, who was dead, not to Rochambeau. So he began to fight again. Dessaline and his men returned atrocity for atrocity, killing all whites and malots they found. Every day, newspapers in the United States carried news of the bloody massacres in San Domingue, especially those committed by Dessaline. American businessmen were afraid to go to San Domingue to trade. French losses under Rochambeau were as great as those under Leclerc. The yellow fever epidemic continued to spread among the new French troops. Dessaline gave orders that every white person on San Domingue should be shot, hanged, burned, taken offshore, and drowned. Napoleon considered the terrible news and decided that the war on San Domingue wasn't worth fighting. He was determined now to invade England, yet had lost most of his finest fighting men on San Domingue. He made an expensive error. Invading Louisiana was also now out of the question. He gave orders for his remaining soldiers to return to France. San Domingue could have its independence. Rochambeau surrendered to Dessaline. As soon as he did, he had nowhere to turn except to the British, France's enemy. He surrendered to them, choosing life as a British prisoner of war rather than death under Dessaline. He and fewer than 2,000 wounded, exhausted, sick, and dying soldiers, all that was left of the French army in Saint Domingue, were taken to England as prisoners of war on British warships. The remaining civilians boarded commercial vessels and were taken to Jamaica, Cuba, or New Orleans, beginning their life with nothing. You can see the picture here. Leaving on rowboats, going to the large ships out in the bay. Dessaline had triumphed. He now ruled the devastated but independent island. He ripped the white stripe out of the red, white, and blue flag of the French Republic to make a new flag for the nation he would call Haiti. Long ago, the original Arawak Indians who lived on the island before Columbus discovered it called it that. The name meant Land of the Mountains. Columbus had called it Hispaniola for Spain, but the French who colonized it later named it after a saint who they believed looked kindly on them. This saint was signed to me. Dessaline ordered a solid gold crown from goldsmiths in Philadelphia and a beautiful felt robe from England. Since Napoleon was about to be crowned Emperor Napoleon I of France, Dessaline decided he should be crowned Emperor Jacques I of Haiti. But his rule was short. Not much more than a year, violence ruled. Dessaline was assassinated by followers of Henry Christophe, who crowned himself King Henry I of Haiti. He and a mulatto leader named André Pression divided the country into two parts, one part ruled by King Henry I and the other by a more modest Pression. Christophe's personality became more and more bizarre. His extravagance is legendary. He built a magnificent palace called Sans Souci, which means without a care and a mammoth fortress overlooking the harbor in Le Cap, a fortress to defend his terrain from the French, who in his deepening mistrust of everyone, he would sure would come again. Even when he was nothing more than a waiter in a hotel, Christophe had loved high living. The parties he threw at Sans Souci were lavish beyond belief, rivaling those of the kings of France who had been overthrown by the hungry and neglected people. People soon forgot about the achievements of the Haitian Revolution, which had been born out of the best ideas of the French Revolution. After six years, Christophe, although still young, suffered a stroke and became paralyzed. He fell into deep depression and committed suicide. The legacy of greedy French monarchs became Hades, and the world judged that young nation by the extravagance and selfishness of Christophe and the brutality of Dessaline, not by the quiet and visionary Toussaint, who died quietly in a cold and miserable prison across the sea. But he is the one we should remember. One last amazing portrait of Toussaint Dessaline. The prize. Sorry, my cat's drinking water. You might be able to hear him. You can see Thomas Jefferson, Lewis and Clark. The prize. The American ambassador to France offered more, once more to buy the port of New Orleans. This time Napoleon agreed. The only condition France made was that the United States buy not only New Orleans, but also all the Louisiana territory. Napoleon needed money so badly that he didn't quibble over the price. He just ordered that payment and paperwork be done quickly. This sale has been called the greatest land bargain in history. When the Louisiana territory was ceded to the United States in 1803, no one had any idea how much land there was. Thomas Jefferson's secretary, Meriwether Lewis, and an army officer named William Clark was given the job of organizing a group of 28 men called the Corps of Discovery to explore and map the territory. These vast new lands made the United States the huge wealthy world power it is today. 
while American fortunes rose, Napoleon's fell. His huge losses on San Domingue were be the beginning of his end. In 1815, the English Duke of Wellington defeated him at the Belgian town of Waterloo, not far from the French border. Napoleon was taken prisoner by the British and moved to a remote island off the coast of South Africa. It was a sad and ironic ending for the man of destiny. The island of St. Helena was an impossible, it was impossible to escape from as the fort shoe, where he'd sent Toussaint to die. As Napoleon reviewed his life and dictated his memoirs, he wondered what would have happened had he worked with Toussaint Louverture rather than wasting so many soldiers and trying to destroy him. He felt this was the greatest mistake he had made in his extraordinary life. Like Toussaint, Napoleon also died on his island prison. The Louisiana Purchase changed history. The rich lands and great mineral resources in the West made the United States the most powerful nation in the world and it came about because of a quiet, brave black man who was inspired by what he read, who came to help the wounded in the sugarcane fields of Santo Ming and saw openings to a world where liberty ruled. The end. I hope you enjoyed that. My cat woke up and he's been crying for treats because <laughs> he knows I want him quiet so I give him treats when I film. So I'm going to go feed my cat. video if you learned something interesting. I know I learned a lot from this book. Thank you for watching.